All right. Uh, good morning, everyone, wherever you are. And uh, thank you so much for, for coming. I hope that it's well with you wherever you are and God is keeping to bless you and to lead you and to guide you. And that uh, his blessing, you are being here to study together, young and old, married and unmarried. You know, I have come to realize that even in our married life, we, we are going to be learning. We are going to be learning, ever learning. And we are going to be seeing our mistakes and praying that God gives us grace to rectify them. Because some of our mistakes, even while we are forming our marriages, have been all wrong. So I don't think that there is just any person who should not be attending these classes. I don't care how old you are. I want to know what God's will was even for my life years ago and how I was able to get out of God's will. And I want to pray about it. And in praying about it, I, I, I want to, I, I want to perfectly um, improve my life so that it can look just like what Jesus Christ wants it to be like. So that's what I want to do in life and today, tomorrow. I want my family to be like, just like what Christ wants it to be. And so that's why I want to learn daily. And that's why we want to be interacting and sharing about the word of God. So let's pray and get started. So I'll just take off my camera to pray with us and then, then we'll, be, we'll get started. Father in heaven, you are so thankful that you have accepted that we should gather to study your word. Please, Lord, there are many people who are coming with different prayer requests. Greatest of all, that speak to us, O oh Father. That's the prayer of many of us. Because we have come here, Lord, to know your will. Don't let your word return void, but let's accomplish for that purpose for which it was written and sent from heaven. This is our prayer by faith in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, allow me to say that, and I'll start from where I started yesterday. There are a lot of miserableness in the world, in our marriages. And you know the reason why? Because people are looking all in a wrong direction, in a wrong place, for peace, for love, for chastity, for kindness. People are looking for good families but they're looking it all about in a wrong place. Some people are looking at it over the media and the media is largely where people are learning how to be better parents, how to be better uh, fathers, how to be better mothers, how to be better women in a relationship and how to be better men in a relationship. It's all in the media. That's where people are looking at. Some are looking to uh, their friends. They're trying to copy men. They're trying to copy what other people are like. I have interacted with some people and they're telling me, brother so-and-so said this, and so I want to follow that. And let me tell you, that's where the problem is. Some are looking to counselors. And I'm not saying that um, we shouldn't be at much having counselors down here. And we'll be talking about that. But then they're looking all at the wrong place. Some are looking, I have known and had of marriages uh, or relationships, not even marriages themselves. I've had people who are courting and one of them have gone to a witch doctor. I've prayed for such a person before. And then just things turned into a mess because you know that God says that none of you should seek of these necromancers, of these witch doctors, of these sorcerers and so on for God hates it. Israel should not seek after any divination. People go to wake doctors to keep their marriages running. I have seen people who have money, but they are so worried about their relationship. It is so shaky. And the question is, why are they worried? 
I, I, I doubt why people should be in a courtship that is godly, that is set on the right foundation. And then after a few months or a few years, they begin getting worried and um, I mean anxious and suspicious about the future of that relationship. It means it was all in a wrong foundation. And so parents are ever worried, you know, our daughter might separate with that brother and that brother is rich, all right? It's because people are all looking in the wrong direction. Some are looking for money. Some are looking for romantic guys. Some are looking for, you know, all those things that people are looking at. We will be able to mention them one by one in Steps to Marriage. And we'll be able to understand that this is the major reason why there are a lot of misery. This is the old reason why there's a lot of tears in our marriages. Marriages are torn. I'm telling you the truth. It looks like a bed of roses to those who have not entered. But let me tell you, marriages are torn. People are weeping in their houses. People are fighting. Some people are not talking. Hey, all right? You see, some people don't accept correction in their marriages, all right? You just don't want to hear what she's telling you or what he's telling you. And so this has brought all this trouble in marriages today. And I like giving practical examples, practical examples. I remember a time while I was in college, I was this time that um, a senior student called me. I was, I was just a junior in college, but I don't know why this sister called me. And so this sister called me and told me, <coughs> Brother Zado, I was young. Actually, I was in first year for your information. This was a church leader in her fourth year. And she called me, it was night. And she was asking me, Brother Zado, what's wrong? I have been dating this young Adventist man. I just came into the Adventist faith. And he is a church leader, in fact, a senior church leader in our very own church, the university church. And brother, I have gone to his house and I've realized that he has another lady there who is also a church member. And she was crying and asking herself, where are the men who can follow the principles that we hear being taught in church? And we're asking ourselves, why are all these things happening in life? Why are all these things happening in relationships? It's because we are all looking in a wrong direction. I know of some cases where someone is looking at a man who quotes the spirit of prophecy like never before. Ah, all right, that's all right. And I love quoting the spirit of prophecy. I like quoting the Bible. By the way, let me just make a, a light moment. But there is this sister who came to a friend of mine and the friend of mine said, no, I don't think that I am convicted to be with you. And this lady ensured that she got the pulpit next time. And at the pulpit, she ensured that she had memorized all the spiritual prophecy what she wanna use in the Bible. And she started fitting them and spitting them. And I said, you see, I understand the Bible. I understand the spiritual prophecy. I think I'm the right human being. How can you go about it? Someone who can quote even a single spiritual prophecy quote. But that was not the whole issue. I remember one of my friends telling me, uh, she had told her uh, 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 girlfriend then that, hey, for now, I do not need to hear you quote that spiritual prayer. I know it. I want to see that you are the right human. And so sometimes we look all in the wrong direction. And it's not wrong to memorize the spiritual prophecy. Hallelujah, if you can be able to memorize it. It's not wrong to memorize the Bible, but sometimes people look at the outside rather than the inside. Have this spirit of prophecy been memorized to convert life or been memorized with an intention of tapping others into, into an emotional experience with you? This is all that matters. And that is why you realize that in looking at a wrong direction, we find ourselves in a situation whereby um, we are forming marriages that are full of tears. Now, um, is God calling you to marriage? That's our first question. It is the first step that you need to look into. Is God calling you into marriage? I was like, God calls people into marriage, yes. 
Just the same way he calls people into ministry, God calls people into marriage. Let's think about it a while. Is there any person in the church who is not called to be a missionary? Certainly not. All children of God are called to be representatives of Christ to the world. We are all called to be light. The mother in the home is called to be a missionary in the home. The call putter is called to be a missionary. The gardener is called to be a missionary in the garden. All of us in one sector or another have been called to be missionaries. You need to be asking yourself wherever you are, your job place, your institution, are you a missionary of Christ? Are you representing Christ? Yeah, so you can say that if someone is called especially to be a moving, living preacher, so that you move from one place to another, sharing the word of God, establishing churches and missions, and opening up projects for the development of the third angel's message, then you're like, he is the missionary and we are not missionaries. Ideally, all of us need to be missionaries because according to Ministry of Healing 395, it says that true education is missionary training. All sons and daughters of God have been called to be missionaries. And so we need to understand that all sons and daughters of God have been called to be missionaries. So there is a calling of the whole church into missionary work, but at the same time, there is a calling of specific individuals to be living, working ministers or missionaries. Let me give you another example. All church members have been called to be medical missionaries. And yet at the same time, there are specific church members who have been called to be physicians who will be living their whole time as dedicated medical missionaries. So you need to be able to see how Ellen White plays with her statements really well to be understood and cannot be confused. Now, does God call men to marriage? Yes. The Bible, of course, says marriage is a noble thing and that God would decide that everyone has, um, uh, God would decide that every one of us have, uh, welcome so much, Sister um, um, uh, Allison. And um, God would have all of us enter into a marriage relations. But that does not mean that God is calling. I, I was reading a Facebook post and a man was saying that this year, 2021, every young man needs to get married who is 25 years old. And he said, if, if, if the lady says no, give me her contact and I'll call that young lady and tell her you need to get married to that man. And I, I, I talked frankly to him, I told him, brother, I don't think you're directing the youths in the right direction. It's okay they're in that age, but age is more than just figures. Age is more than just a span of time. You can be 28 yet still a baby. And you can be 22 and yet you are mature enough. And so there are a lot of factors that can be looked at beyond just age. And we need to understand those things. All right. so. I was just sharing with him and saying there is something called the call into marriage. And it's the same way as the call into missionary work. It's the same way as the call into all, all, all these other aspects that God calls his people into. Are you ready? Or rather, are you being called to marriage? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 17. And this will interest you as we begin. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Verses number 17, interesting thought. This is what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 17. It says, but as God hath distributed to how many man? To every man. As the Lord hath called everyone, so let him walk. And so ordained I in all churches. What is the subject of um, discussion in chapter 7? is marriage and you'll understand that that's why it says and you can read even from verse number 16 for what knowest thou O wife whether thou shalt save thy husband or what knowest thou O man whether thou shalt save thy wife but as god hath distributed to every man who distributes to every man god is it god who distributed to adam yes it is god who gave to adam number two it says God distributes to every man, number one. And then he says, God also has called everyone. So there is a calling into marriage. God is calling you to be married. And then God provides the person to be married to. To every man, God has a special mate for him. <clears throat> and so what must that man do? 
that man must spend time to pray. You understand that? That man must spend time to pray. And in spending time to pray, that person will be able to know exactly uh, what's the will of God in their life. So I is God calling you to marry? Let's look at that a little bit and understand what um, this all mean. All right. <clears throat> we are told in... Um, um, in um, uh, Advent is on 49. Is God calling you to marry deals with time? Is it time? Is it time that God is calling me to be married? Is it time? Is it time? And there are a lot of factors that determine whether it is time, all right? And we're looking at them in a nutshell. Let every step towards a marriage alliance by be characterized by modesty, simplicity, sincerity. Let me talk about that. Sincerity. Are you sincere? Young people, we need to be sincere. We need to be simple and modest, right? There are a lot of people who stretch their courtship relationship beyond simplicity, beyond sincerity, and beyond modesty. It's immodest. It is immodest. And that's why it's done behind uh, walls, it is done in darkness, it's done where people cannot always do what? Cannot always see us, all right? And the number two, most courtships are, are formed in, 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 I mean, wrong places. Huh? They are formed in phones while people are texting at night or late at night and they're like, okay, we can be able to begin courting, all right? All these things are happening crazy. Some of them are formed when people have gone for some crazy, uh, what do you call it? Sunday stuff, you understand that? And they say like, we need to begin courting. All right, Court, courtship should be, begin by modesty, by simplicity, by sincerity. Are you sincere? Are you truthful? Are you getting it? Are you sincere about your commitment or are you trying out things? This asking ourselves, I, I have to understand that in court, that people are quite a, a number, in a number of ways, some people are, uh, exercise a lot of lie. There are people who basically lie in their marriage, in their courtship, and there are people who actually say words which they didn't really mean, all right? I will die without you, all right? You've had such statement, right? I can't live without you. Those statements that are posted on social media are statements of selfishness, all right? A person who says, I can't live without you will soon say, I cannot live with you. Yes, because um, ideally we need to understand the principles. When you begin hearing certain statements from someone, who is dedicating themselves to you, you can know whether they are ready for marriage or not ready for marriage, all right? The way they are behaving in that courtship is sufficient enough to show you whether they are ready for that marriage, all right? When they always expect benefits and they don't know how to, how to handle your, uh, 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 your, your simple mistakes, all right? Uh, let's say, for example, uh, you agreed to meet somewhere, all right? And you say, all right, let's meet at this place and just spend some time talking and praying. It's an open place, a public place. And uh, think about what the Lord is doing for us. And then the ma you delay, the sister delays one hour, two hours. And then there you are. And the first thing that in the call is a shout and complaints and everything. Well, that looks like that's all right. You always violated the issue of keeping time, which is one of the gifts that God holds so highly. And the man can quote for your Bible verse anyway. But uh, look at it this way. It's also testing his patience at the same time. <laughs> All right? Because maybe you can also say, you know, I was testing your patience. When I make mistakes, how will you handle the situation? All right? So um, even the way in which we react to certain mistakes even in our normal life, can show if you are ready for marriage. You understand? You can see how a young man behaves in church when he's offended, how he handles other sisters, and you can know whether he's ready for marriage or not ready for marriage. All right? All right, so it says it must be marked with simplicity and sincerity and honest purpose to please and honor who? 
is his desire to please and honor God. So if his desire is not to please and honor God, but to fulfill the lust of the flesh, that's not the right man. That's not the right human. And he says marriage affects the afterlife, both in this world and in the world to come. Exactly. And you are not only going to face trouble in the world to come. In this life, there are a lot of suicides that are happening because of wrong marriages. A sincere Christian will make no plans that God cannot do what? God cannot approve. All right? It's very important. And the devil is seeking. Satan is constantly busy to hurry in experience to what? Youths. This is what Satan is doing. He's hurrying in experienced youths into doing what? Into marriage. This is what they are doing, all right? There's a time that I was sharing, the sister was telling the sister, you are not ready for marriage. And I can tell you that of a fact. You are not ready for marriage. I was telling the sister. And she was thinking, no, 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 but I can love. I don't know. You cannot. You are not ready to be married. You are still fit to be under the care of your parents. To, be, to learn enough, to spend more time enough, to know how to be responsible as a lady in the house, to know how to do your course, to know how to uh, act with the, the opposite sex. These are all things you are going to learn while you're still under your parents. You're not going to learn them in marriage. All right. So the Bible says that Satan is constantly busy to hurry inexperienced youths into marriage alliances. This is what he's doing. Many of these marriages are formed in colleges and they always end up in the wrong direction. If it is heartbreak before the marriage or they get in a position where you all have children which you cannot take care of and then the man gives you up seeing another woman or the woman gives you up seeing another man. It all happens because of inexperience marriages which are being entered into be sober therefore and be vigilant because your adversary the devil is as a rolling lion walking about walking about seeking whom he may devour whom you must resist steadfast in what in faith all right we must resist him steadfast in faith listen carefully in adventist on page 71 where we are told if men and women are in the habit of praying twice a day before they contemplate what marriage why you praying twice or so three times or whatever day before you contemplate, not enter, not identify the woman? Are we together in that? Yes, this, is, this might be a hard one for you to take in. We are told when they contemplate, they should double their prayer, should pray four times a day when such a step is anticipated. When you begin to contemplate marriage, you understand now? We are not talking about, we are not talking about when you begin coaching, when you've already known the woman, right? When you contemplate, I am now ready, I am contemplating to have a woman who will live with me, you must now double your prayer life, all right? So many people begin to pray when already they have seen the woman, all right? They say, all right, let's begin to pray. No, the prayer is ideally before, while you are anticipating to get a woman or get a man. You should double your prayer life so that God can be able to impress upon your mind who that woman is. And you were able to speak yesterday about how God can speak to you. Impressions of the Holy Spirit, the scriptures, and God can also speak to you about what? Uh, uh, through, uh, through providence, isn't it? Say through providence. Those are three major ways in which God can speak to you. And I remember I was praying and I had certain things. I was saying, God, I want a woman who you will show me clearly will fulfill the thing that I'm reading. Right? I, I was reading a book. I was reading a book and that book was really interesting. I was asking God, where is the woman who will be like the person described in this book? At some, the same time, I was asking myself, where is me fulfilling the things written in this book? I was asking myself those two questions were really huge. And so I had to spend time praying uh, about that whole idea. Okay, the question is asked, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways? And the answer is given by taking it there, uh, there too, according to thy word. And then we're told the young man who makes the Bible his word, his God, need not make mistake, need not mistake the path of duty and of safety. And then we are told, 
that blessed book will teach him to preserve his integrity of character, to be truthful, to practice no deception, no trickery, all right? So how am I going to know it's time? I'm going to know God is calling me. <clears throat> is it time? God is calling me because I have studied the scriptures and I've seen the qualities that God needs. So <clears throat> majorly, when God is calling you, you don't look at the other partner. Do you look at the other partner? No, no, no. Whom are you looking at? Yourself. You are searching yourself. Is God calling me? Am I having the character attributes that a right husband should be having? You begin searching yourself. So the first step is self uh, search. You have to search yourself. Is that how we always begin? No. We always look at the other lady, isn't it? You say it's good, she is kind. Okay, so question, why do you want to make a life miserable? You know, that's selfishness. So begin looking at your life. So are you making the Bible your guide? Are you studying? Okay, you want a home that is full of devotions, a home that is full of nice times. Well, the truth of the matter is you yourself is not devotion. You don't pray. You don't study your Bible in the morning. You don't seek all these things. How on earth are you going to spend time in your marriage studying the Bible, doing missionary work when you yourself didn't know about it? All right? Okay, so you must begin to by, by searching your heart. Okay, let's continue. We know that marriage, uh, 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 we are told in chapter 17 of the book of Luke, they did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah did enter into the ark. And we are told that in the last day, it shall be just so. So what was really happening? We are told that uh, there is in itself no sin in eating and drinking or marrying and giving in marriage. It was um, lawful to marry in the time of Noah, yes. And it is lawful to marry now. I know there are people who are actually have approached me and told me, you know, Professor, we should not be marrying right now because you understand prophecy and you've read the book Last Day Events. And Last Day Events is clearly saying that fewer marriages should be contracted today. And saying that so there's time that we give up this idea of marriage. I do not think that that is uh, rightly dividing the word of God. We need to understand that's not rightly dividing the word of God, yes? Much caution must be given because one of the signs of the coming son of man, soon coming son of God, is marriages that are supposedly being entered into and that are miserable. You understand what I'm talking about? And so much caution should be done and fewer should be entered into. What does that mean? Because many of them have nothing but the devil to control them. All right? And so that's why we need to be careful. And then he says, uh, um, if that which is lawful is properly treated and not carried into its sinful excesses, then it's all right. But in the days of Noah, men carried, men married without consulting who? God. So is it happening today? We enter into relationships without consulting God or seeking his guidance. This is really huge. So we are entering into marriages without consulting God or seeking his guidance. And this is why there is a huge mess we don't seek the counsel of God. We don't seek the counsel of uh, uh, brethren in the faith. And so we don't seek his guidance. We don't consult God. We should be consulting God. We should be speaking to God about this matter. Young man, spend time speaking with God about this matter. Okay, trust in the Lord with all thine what? Now, yesterday, we talked about giving God your heart. Amen. Now we are talking about trusting God with all thine work. Thine heart, because you had given God your heart. And lean not unto thine own understanding. Don't lean on your own understanding. The nasty things you've watched in the soap opera cannot help your marriage. All the marriage counselors that have gone to the most the huge schools, uh, universities, cannot save your marriage, all right? Yes, all the counselors that you have in this world cannot save your marriage. So lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. In deciding upon any course of action, we are not to ask whether we can see that harm will result from it. No. What should we be asking? We should be asking whether it is in the keeping with the will of what? The will of God. All right? 
There could be no problem, but it's not keeping with the will of God. The issue is, is it keeping with the will of God? That's what that dear sister should be asking herself. Is it in keeping with the will of God? That's what we should be asking ourselves. Okay. Let's look at some things. The road to marriage. The road to marriage. There are two roads we normally take. There is one road that is we have categorized as dating, all right? Then there's another road that's categorized as courtship, all right? Because it's talking about courtship or marriage. Now, in dating, um, dating is random. Random. There is no prayer in dating. You don't pray. You don't anticipate marriage. In dating, in most cases, you bump into a woman, all right? I went to town or I went into a music Sabbath. I've never been praying about marriage. I saw this lady, she was singing so nicely. And I thought like we could exchange contacts and we became friends. And then that's what people always tell me, how they met their wives. Very few people, you realize, spend time to pray about something. And having prayed about something, they dedicated themselves and they are waiting for the fulfillment of God's promise upon their prayers and they're doing everything in their life to get themselves also ready each day for that particular event so many people are randomly entering into this so they don't spend time praying right courtship is deliberate this is what i've been saying about courtship is deliberate why god i think my impressions are telling me i need to marry so what am i going to do I am going to spend time praying and asking you if it is it's your will in my life. You are calling me to truly be married. So it is deliberate. So that when God answers my prayers, I can say, yes, I was, I was getting ready for marriage and I've been asking God if it should be so, right? So courtship is deliberate, all right? Okay, the goal of dating is romance. Okay, that's what attracted you to that woman. You don't look at the responsibilities. Hey, excuse me. When you meet that woman or man on the road, or when you meet that man or woman in the market or in a seminar, did you begin asking yourself, is she the right woman for my family? Can she prepare my food? You understand what I'm talking about? Can she be able to take care of my children? Can that man be responsible? Does he love God? Are those the things that go about your mind? Those are things you begin finding out later. And you begin asking questions now my husband rather my boyfriend is doing this and this okay you didn't find out your boyfriend loves media is ever on tv and movies all right hey i need to talk to young ladies if your boyfriend is ever on movies you better be careful because he's going to do that which is in the movie on you you understand he's going to insult you he's going to hit you he's going to point a gun at you yeah because a movie hypnotizes the human brain. And we need to understand that media is one of the tools that have been used to destroy family relations. And one of the things God is going to do in the last days, God is going to win us out of media because media is the greatest source of heresy and lie. Media is destroying our marriages. I said media can keep you fired close. You can all be in the same house, but you are all at all the other places. Someone is chatting to someone else else, and we thank God for some elements of media and technology like we are able to communicate right now. But it's also a tool that the devil is highly using, all right? The tool that the devil is highly using so that you, you, you spend more time on Facebook or more time on, 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 on Instagram and more time on, on, on WhatsApp than you want to spend with your family, all right? And so you need ample time with your family. Whether you are a minister, you need breaks, all right? I'm also speaking to myself. You need breaks and say, oh, I, I need to go out with my, my family and just spend some time in nature. Some time just with my family. We'll be able to read all those things if we find time. But then what really happens is courtship is deliberate. And the other one, dating is random. The goal is romance in dating. The goal is romance. Well, what's the goal in courtship? The goal is marriage. The goal is marriage. So you are not playing games to find out if you will marry. You already decided you want to marry and God is leading you. Okay, what's the goal in uh, what's uh, dating is unprotected. I'll explain that. And courtship is protected. You know what protects courtship? One, courtship is open. Courtship is not hidden. 
all right? Uh, all right, hidden and unhidden, open and closed does not mean you go to season and announce that I'm getting into courtship, right? But open means that you should not be, uh, rather open means, so public means, you should not be doing that courtship in a way that you don't want anyone to know. You are doing everything to keep it to yourself. You understand? There are two extremes. There is that extreme of excitement where you want everyone to know. You're already married, post on Facebook, post on WhatsApp, all these things and everything that you're doing is ever on social media, ever everywhere, all right? No, I don't think that's what God is calling us to do, all right? Yeah, but I don't think God is also calling us to be too confined to ourselves that even our parents should not know, all right? If we want to meet, we want to meet behind walls. You understand what I'm saying? In darkness, you understand what I'm saying? No one should be knowing about this, all right? No, if you are boyfriend or husband says, no one should ever know about this, that's all wrong. And if another one says, everyone should know about it, that is wrong. You understand the two extremes? So you need to balance the two, isn't it? Those who are counseling you, the elders can know, all right? The pastor can know. Your parents should know, isn't it? It's protected. It's protected. How is it protected? Courtship has limits. When you are courting, you are preparing for marriage. So it is protected in this sense. There are things that you can do to me in courtship. And there are only privileges you'll find in marriage, isn't it? Uh, dating is not always that protected. There are things we can do and we'll keep doing and we'll keep doing them and we'll end up in marriage, all right? Now, these things, most of them cause temptation to you as an individual and will lead you to sin, all right? Okay, the dating is unnatural settings of perpetual recreation is always chosen. You understand now? Where, where are the places you choose for your dating uh, meetings? A club? Uh, while you were in school, you go out for a rave, a night time, right? In the nearby towns. It's a dating, isn't it? Places with very, I mean, uh, worldly secular music. There are places of dating, right? Do you want to choose that you are going to date in an open, natural place? It's always a natural, right? You don't want, you don't love nature. You don't want to be just somewhere in a place where there are trees that it's open, it's not closed and so on. You don't want that to be the place you want to go to, isn't it? You want to go to very unnatural places. You want to go to the most classy hotel. You want to do all these things. I don't think that that's what it constitutes. Natural in, 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 in courtship is natural setting of real life and family. Natural setting. And you're looking at life in reality, real life and family. Okay, you are looking at how you can be better. And I'll talk about these things a little bit so we are able to see them in a practical life. What's a real life experience? For example, I've asked youths, tell me if your boyfriend sags his trouser and walks with his trouser halfway down, uh, uh, the question should be, is this the man you want to present to your husband or your, your, your parents? So real life should tell you that ideally I don't want a husband like that. I used to tell students in college all time through, if this man is sagging, if this man is dressing some very tight jeans and walking around, okay, it may look nice. And some lady says, oh, that's nice. All right, but I ask him, is that the person you want to appear at the gates of your parents? Dressed that way with those kind of shoes, right? Okay, I want you to think about yourself in maybe four years into marriage and you've gone into an official meeting and your husband appears with those kinds of shoes and a tight jeans and you want to say that's my husband no i'm sure you don't like it but what you are you wanted a man who is in a suit and in a tie and well dressed you want to say yeah that's my husband okay what kind of a woman would you want to enter into your home a woman who's a half naked suddenly not a woman who is dressed this way, suddenly no. You want someone who is modest. You can say, that's my dear wife. 
isn't it? And so if you cannot look at that today, there is just no way you're going to look at it in marriage. And so the real life setting, how is it going to be? Because you're not only going to put a suit in African culture when you're going to pay it out, or dress decently when you're going to pay it out. You must daily have been dressing decently, isn't it? So you're not going to take off your dirty clothes and all these things and uh, miserable uh, dressing and then say, just, just for today. I want them to see me as the one who's taking their daughter. Okay? You know, even dressing can show if you're mature or not mature. Hello, everyone. You need to understand that. Yes, my sister. Dressing can show maturity or immaturity. And it can show whether you are ready. Just look at the way you are dressing and ask yourself, you're dressing like who? Like a, a baby or like a boy? Like who? All right? Is it the dressing of people who are responsible? All right? And, and, and I know that while I was in college, sisters knew that there was a group of people by their dressing who are responsible. So if you came into some tight jeans and so on and tight t-shirts, you say, this one must be looking to use me just for a, same, a, a short time and it'll dump me. Okay, let's continue. Dating could be a practice for divorce, but courtship could be a training for marriage. Dating is rose colored with glasses, all right? Rose colored glasses, beautiful, all right? Everything is colored. The home is colored. <clears throat> the wedding is already colored, right? What kind of a wedding would you want us to have? <clears throat> All right, you, you understand that? A classy wedding, we need flowers, we need sleek vehicles, all these things, all right? You can see the posts on Facebook, they are all capturing the dress style, not even considering can we afford it, all right? Yes, that's what happened. And you can always see it in weddings. When you see a wedding that is beyond your ability, then you can know that the problem was dating. All right? Yes, I was speaking to an elder friend of mine, and he, was, he took a high place in, 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 in counseling. As he told us, Zara, let me tell you one thing. Be who you are. Be Zara, and it shall be well with you. And then I'll be talking about this. I wish I find time because another place where people mess is weddings, all right? And I don't know, Sammy, how we did slip this in because this is very serious. The wedding ceremony, all right? This is very serious, the most messed uh, uh, thing. <clears throat> and you know, this Ella was talking to me and telling about a man who did a very classy wedding. And after he'd done a classy wedding, I'll not mention the church because it's known all over the country. And this man didn't have a place to go that night. He slept in the church compound in the car which he had hired that night. And they'd done about a million worth wedding, I think, a very expensive wedding. But they had a lot of debts that they were to sort out. And the man didn't have any happiness. He was stressed. He didn't want to incur any other debt by going into a hotel. He didn't have anywhere to go. Imagine it was too obsessed with marriage, the wedding day, he didn't even think of where he's gonna spend. And he didn't have faith. You know, you can be in a point where you don't know where you're gonna sleep, but you have faith God is gonna provide and you're doing everything and it's right before God. But he was not even having faith that God could provide. And so he spent in the car, the whole night, the wedding car. It was so sad. And they just realized in the morning, and so this is happening all over, dear friends. It's happening all over. All right. Courtship as a magnifying glass, all right? Courtship as a magnifying glass. You look at things into details. You take things and then you look at them into the real life, all right? We want to organize such a wedding. Are we able to afford it? What are the factors that we need to look into? What are the things that we need to do? I think that we need to disabuse ourselves of all these things. And I think one of the things people don't study completely about is preparation for a wedding. That one, Brother Sam, we need to bring it up. Preparation for a wedding. It's so important. We have studied it. With, uh, Brother Sam has put documents online that are able to show us these steps. I think it's the most corrupted institution 
uh, uh, I mean, uh, in the marriage ceremony, ceremonies among the other singles. Let's continue so that we can be able to. Uh, when you are preparing, is God calling me? Thou shalt not commit adultery. It's a very important thing. Why is that? That is because many people do not know that God has a limit in courtship. Adultery is bringing in of any third party into this relationship. Now, somebody says, oh, that's talking about married people. I want to tell you, friends, the seventh commandment is just as much for single people as it is for married people. Until a young man has demonstrated full obedience to the seventh commandment, single is not ready to be married. It's not ready to be what? To be married. If you cannot be faithful, it's not ready to be married. And so with a young woman, if he has never learned how to keep that commandment, let's face it. The wedding day has come, the bride and the groom stand there before the minister. And the question is put to that young man, will you, John, Jonas, take this woman, Mary Smith, to be your wife, wedded wife, to live with her after God's ordinance in the holy state of matrimony? Will you love her, honor her, cherish her, forsake all others, and keep you only unto her as long as you both shall live? Now listen, there are many a young man, if they were really honest, would have to say something like this. Of course, this has never happened, minister. I just say it would have to happen. If it, if we were dealing with realities instead of forms and ceremonies. So are you telling me that there is a lot of theatrics, drama in a marriage ceremony? People don't think through the vows, isn't it? Because if you thought you'd say like, ah, minister, pastor, if it was a reality, I would not answer what I'm going to answer. But because it's a drama, the wedding is majorly a drama as it is today. People don't think. Do you, do you know, I, I, I had to go through uh, the vows that are going to be taken before I, I, I take those vows and listen to what I'm committing myself to. It's like baptism. You're going to know what you're going to be asked if you believe in before you just appear. You understand? To take the vows. So I need to understand. Lest the minister ask me something that I cannot dedicate myself and commit myself to. And so listen, if it was a reality, that young man would have to say something like this to the minister, preacher, what is this you are asking me? You are asking me to promise that I'm never to look at another girl again? Never to make love to another girl? That I'm supposed to keep this one as long as we both shall live and keep myself only unto her, my eyes, my hands, my thoughts, my heart, my body, all just for her and her alone, preacher. That's asking a lot. The preacher would have to say, if he stuck to the word of God, yes, it's asking a lot. It is asking everything from you. All right. Then the young man, if you are really honest, would have to conclude that the dialogue by saying, preacher, I want to tell you the truth. I don't know whether I could promise that and keep it or not. I've never tried. Since I was a teenager and all the way through, I've run with whoever I felt like. If I could get them, I'll put my hands where I pleased. If the other party permitted it, I've run fast with this one and that one, and sometimes with several at once. And now you are asking me to leave all that and keep myself on this day to this girl? What has the wedding day just done? Can the gowns change me? Can the classy wedding change me, all right? It's not. People are not realistic on subject of marriage. They say you'll offend people. You don't like the happiness of people. Let me tell you, I'm one strict minister. I can say I'm not going to be part of that marriage, and I will not be part of that marriage. I can say I'm not going to go with that courtship, and it's fine. You might not like me. You might not want to talk to me again. That's fine. But I am going to be slow to put my hands, lay my hands upon any or any marriage or approve of any marriage that I feel God is impressing me is not in God's order. I do not know, preacher. I don't know whether I can do it or not. So I'm very frank to you. That should be the case. Isn't that interesting? That would be really honest. Wouldn't it be 
as I say, that never happened. But oh, my dear friends, if you really want a happy home, a successful home, a Christian home, you'll have to start keeping the seventh commandment when you're a child. You'll have to start guarding your affections and controlling your affections and passions and not letting your thoughts run after this one and that one and this one and that one and this one and that one and your body follows suit. Oh no, we are told that won't do. All right. So I'm looking at this in a little short while. Am I prepared for marriage? Isn't it? Am I prepared for what? For marriage. Okay, uh, am I prepared for marriage? This one, I'll leave it a few things and then we'll just bam it there. Am I prepared for marriage? Where does a man get a good wife? A prudent wife is from who? The Lord, God has called you, so who provides? The Lord, so let's get the equation if this is really biblical. The Bible says, the spirit of prophecy says, his beatings are his enablings, isn't it? So if God has called you into something, can he fail to provide? So why do people find it difficult to find their soulmates? It's because God has not called them. Because if God has called you into anything, his biddings, his callings are his enablings. All right? If God has called me into ministry, I don't have to worry about how I shall take care of my family and all. God shall provide as it is in Jesus. You understand? So it might take long, but I'm sure God is going to provide. God is going to provide. That is exactly what God is telling you, right? So that's where to get that good wife. God is going to provide. But let's talk about something in a little while before we see that. We shall find it our wife, find it a good thing, and obtain it the favor of the who? Of the Lord. So the favor is whose? Is the Lord's. Now, there is this Bible verse that says, ask and it shall be done what? Given unto you. Seek and you will do what? You will find. And knock and the door shall be done what? Open unto you. Let's turn that verse all around. Let's think not of ourselves as asking. Let's think of God asking. If God asks of you, will he find? You understand now? If God knocks your heart through the, his messengers, the word, will you open the door? If God seeks you out, will he find you? That's now the right place that I want you to think about. We've thought about us being in that place. And so even a heathen can quote it. Anyone who has nothing to do with God, ask and it shall be given unto you. But think about God as the person asking, will he find? Knocking, will the door be open for him? Okay. So if God was asking you to be a good man, will God find a good man in you? Okay, you are asking God for a good woman, but God is asking you for yourself, isn't it? He's asking you for your heart. Will he get your heart? So why do you want God to provide what to you, what you yourself cannot give to him? You understand? All right, so let's continue and see what's there. A prudent wife is from the Lord. We are told in this beautiful book, uh, Ministry of Healing 359, the heart of her husband doth simply trust in her. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She opened her mouth with what? Are you ready for marriage? A person, are you prepared for marriage? Preparation also has to do with how you open your mouth, all right? Especially should women open their mouth with a lot of wisdom because what you say determines the woman you are. You can just sit in a meeting like this and know which woman is the woman that is provided of the Lord. Which man is the man provided by the Lord? By the way they speak, all right? Sheep speaking is not acceptable, all right? It's not acceptable. People are speaking is not acceptable. Yeah. She opened her mouth with wisdom. And in her tongue is the law of what? Kindness, all right? Kindness. You know, kindness uh, then these are character attributes that we, we really have. Let me tell you, I had a dear parent. I lived with him for a short time when we were living with him, my friend. And he was sharing with us when he went to uh, Britain. And in Britain, they were, um, they were, actually, uh, um, they were actually doing, uh, what was that? He went there to do his education. And you know what was happening? Uh, while they were there, uh, the Africans hadn't learned to say thank you. 
and please assist me with this. So they went to the cafeteria and they were give me this and give me this and give me this and give me this and, me this, and they were fine. So one day the, um, the, 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 the uh, catering team decided that we will not serve them. So they were like, okay, there's a lot of racial differences here. And these guys don't want to serve Africans and everything. And they reported to the dean there was a lot of uh, uh, temperature in the institution. And then these people reported to the dean and said, they are not thankful. And so the next moment, when they had gone without food and gone without food and they were being tested, one of them went and said, uh, please uh, serve me some beef. And they were served. And I was saying, thank you. And they saw a guy who was served. And so everyone followed suit. Please serve me. And it was served. And uh, thank you. And then the guy said, thank you. We like. And, uh, and so they began to, they, you need to appreciate. All right. OK, you were served food by your wife. You really appreciate? OK, she's done your clothes very well. And you're leaving the house a clean man. You say, thank you so much, Annie, for doing this. You don't have to learn it in marriage. There are people who they are. They eat the way and they walk out of the table. They don't say thank you. They don't say please help me with some water. They thought, okay, I've married you. Get me that water so I can drink it. Get my shoes ready so I can do everything. Okay, please thank you uh, for 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 serving us. Thank you for doing this to me. These are things that are not. I mean, they, we feel like all right, that's being too low. I mean, how can a husband, my house, my everything, say thank you? The wife is like, how can I say thank you to my husband? for supplying food to us, for buying us something. It's, it's, it's responsibility, you understand? But a good wife will thank you, thank you, honey, for buying us uh, food today. Okay, thank you even for buying us uh, another uh, set of this. Thank you for doing this to us. They feel, they appreciate every little gift that uh, they find in, in, that come into their life. This is really huge. This is a great blessing, okay? And the Bible says, she looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. Hey, if a woman is idle, that's not the woman. She's not ready for marriage. If you meet an idle one, all right, you need to begin preparing even while you're in college to get off idleness. Idleness is a sin of Sodom. Young people, we need to overcome idleness. Never... Uh, fall into this crazy love with the idle lot of people. There are a lot of idleness in this world. Idleness. <laughs> I wish we'd find time to talk about idleness. That's a crazy one, all right? Because idleness will bring you to a time where, all right, uh, we, could, uh, we could be having all the time at home and everything. No, we need a maid to do everything, isn't it? We need a maid to do everything, all right? I've ever seen a man, he goes to the show and he stands at the show and there are those guys who try to help you doing some things. Maybe they bring you stuff, all right? And you can really carry it, but you're like, okay, because I'm bored and that's the work, you've got to carry it, all right? That's, that's where idleness take us to. So there's a lot of idleness uh, among us people. If, if, if you are a boyfriend or if uh, your husband is idle, you need to pray about that. Idleness, she should not be someone who likes to eat the bread of idleness. She should toil. She can be able to use her hands. She can raise a kitchen garden. She can plant flowers. She can, she can be able to make, um, um, she can be able to do a few works tailoring. You know, like, what do you mean? Yes, she can be able to make a few, uh, uh, a few dressings for uh, seeds and all these things. She can work lovingly with her hand to provide for her family. And I mean that, I mean, I wish you could speak more about it, but no time. Um, her children ar arise up and call her blessed, all right? Husband also praiseth her, saying, many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. He who gains such a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth the favor of the Lord, amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So that's really interesting. Okay, let's keep looking at this. <laughs> Attachment formed in childhood have often resulted in a very wretched unions or disgraceful separations. All right. Early connections, if formed without consent of parents, have seldom proved up. Formed without consent of what? <clears throat> parents. We'll be looking at that at number three. You must seek the counsel of parents. Do you know if you take the heart of a lady without informing the parents, you are a thief? 
you are stealing the affections of that woman prior to the knowledge of the parents. And I've asked some people, how can you take someone's daughter whom he has taken to school and taken care of up to age something without even seeing the parents of that lady? You are a thief, isn't it? Someone has spent so much time and you don't have the guts to go and talk to those parents and they should know you and then ask them, I want to be a friend to your what? Your daughter, okay? The young affection should be restrained until the period arrives when sufficient age and experience will make it honorable and safe to unfetter them, all right? Yes, this should be the case. Those who will not be restrained will be in danger of dragging out an happy existence, all right? Okay, let's continue just seeing that. This is a fast age. Little boys and girls commence doing one paying attention to another when they should both be in the nursery. Yes, you can be little boys in college. You can be little boys in high school. You can be little boys all over. Taking a lesson in Morrison department, what is the effect of this common mixing up? Does it increase chastity in the youth who thus gather together? No, indeed, it increases the first lustful passions. And I'll speak about it clearly. There's a lot of deceptions that have happened amongst the young people. And they do not know that God who sees in darkness also sees in light. I was in college and I saw a lot of messing up. And we were brought up in messing up and we were told to cover it with the garb of, of, of sanctity of going to church. Oh, put on a suit on Sabbath and then put on a tie and carry your Bible as big as you can find one and go to church. But that doesn't matter. One day, I'll tell you a very real story. And I'll not mention names. I came from preaching. I was a young boy in college. And then after that, before I got to school, I was called. And when they called me, they told me, hey, don't get to school. We're having a bash. They call it a bash. That's what I, I don't know what other schools call it, where you are. But they call it a bash, isn't it? Guess what I found out? When I went there, it was night. I was a young boy. I couldn't find my way back to school. I found out that there were men and women in this house. It was outside the school. And these men and women in this house, do you know what they were doing? They were dancing to secular music. They were church leaders. They were deaconesses. They were choir directors. Some of them were deacons. They were dancing to secular music and they were preparing flesh to eat in this house as late as midnight. And I asked myself, God, then why am I in church? There are all other youths who have done this. They've done it openly. People know they've gone for raving in the nearby towns. Then why am I in church? There was a lot of scheme of hypocrisy among the youths in college that sometimes I looked at it and I said, God, why have you allowed us to go through such? There was no proper example. No wonder that Martin Luther says that these universities, these institutions will be a way, a great get to what? To hell. All right? There is a huge scheme of hypocrisy amongst young people in colleges. And I am speaking this having been there, a huge level of hypocrisy. Okay, Bora, Bora, we need an elder. Unapada. Okay, but I can mess up and break up the hearts of ladies. And they complain when they come to church. Who they do they complain to? Because it's the elder who did it anyways. All right? So who do you report to for discipline? Do you report to the deacon? Who? And so there is a huge mess, a high level of hypocrisy. And God has nothing to do with this. All right. Lastful passions. Okay? The forwardness of young girls impressing themselves in company of young men. You always love the company of young men. You don't love the company of your fellow sisters, all right? You always want to visit just men, spend time with them, walk with them, all this. There is no problem interacting with them. We are avoiding the two extremes. But again, the forwardness of young girls in placing themselves in the company of young men, hanging around where they are at work. You see men working, that's where you want to be. You want to talk and all these things. You're the one who's loudest and hard, all right? You are not, uh, I mean, you are, you, you are not conserved in a way. 
uh, we are told, a uh, company of young, hanging around where they are at work, entering into conversations with them, talking common idle is belittling to humanhood. It's belittling to humanhood. Yeah, it lowers them even to the estimation of those who themselves do such things. It lowers you. It lowers you. All right. Cancel to a romantic lovesick lady. You are falling into the sad era, which is so prevalent in this degenerate age, especially with women. You are too fond of the other sex. You love their society. Your attention to them is flattering, and you encourage and permit or permit a familiarity which does not always accord with the exhortation of the apostle to abstain from all appearances of evil. All right. She was sitting in your lips. You were kissing her and she was kissing you. Other scenes of fondness, sensual looks and deportment were presented before me, which sent a thrill of aura through my soul. Your arm encycled the waist and the fondness expressed was having a bewitching influence. Then a curtain was lifted and I was shown you in bed with her. My guide said iniquity and adultery. So my friends, we are seeing this angel recording we cannot see them. It's angels are recording. We need to repent of our past errors. We need to repent of our present errors. That if we have done these things, God should have mercy on us. And so that's very important. Reason being that it didn't begin by these exact uh, readings. It actually began by breaking the barriers, beginning to speak lazily with men, beginning to speak, I mean, I mean, I mean, inappropriate, I mean, cheap talks with, with men and you found yourself in the all wrong direction, all right? Angels are watching and listening. Not one word should be spoken. No one action performed that you would not be willing only angels should look and register in the books about. You should have an eye single to the glory of who? God. Anything different from this is debasing, degrading in courtship and marriage cannot be holy and honorable in the sight of a pure and a holy God unless it is safe to be a safe it is after the exalted uh, unless it is uh unless it is after the exalted scriptural principles a little time is spent in sowing the wild oats dear young friends will produce a crop that will embitter your whole world your whole life a crop that will embitter your whole life all right I told you about the story about a young lady who appeared into the office where I was preaching and she cried to me. She had not even spent a year in marriage, a year in marriage, all right? And their marriage had already broken. She could not stay with the man anymore. She had chosen to move out of the town. She had chosen to leave her husband. She said, I don't think he's my husband. And she told me, I don't think I've ever had any conjugal experience with her, maybe with him. I don't think he's my husband. And I don't think we were ever married. The only thing that binds me and him is the vows we do. I looked at her and said, she's barely 30. And already wrong decisions have set her in her own direction. She's born with vows. She's born with a certificate from the attorney. She cannot change her life. She's looking at her youth. She's looking at her Christian experience and what she will show to the world, but it cannot work out. Her husband is chaotic. Her husband is sending her out of the house, beating her. All right? Wrong direction. Wrong decisions. That's what infatuation brings. That's what we saw out of, and we reap out of it. Just that side. I recently out of a story I'll not mention. Didn't take four months from the marriage. Recently. Didn't take four months. It was a separation. Why are all these things happening? Why are all these things happening? Or you do you think these things are not happening? All right. Maybe you need to step on the other side and begin looking at things from the side. Yes. And I hear like four months and they're already out of marriage. That, yeah, it's true. And what happened? Oh, a brother realized he had married the wife of someone. So how? How? There are steps which was key. From step zero to step number seven. 
isn't it? That's what we do. <laughs> so because we skip those steps, we were not keen enough to even find who is this person, all right? That's the danger of jumping. Oh, I married her, but I didn't know that uh, she was having this disease. So then she tells you that, you know, I normally suffer epilepsy. No, 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 you can't be my wife. So what? If you wanted to make those decisions, you have made them in the first step. But you, you jumped over all these steps, all right? All right, may God have mercy on us. Okay, we are told, um, you may have <clears throat> but one youth, make that useful. <clears throat> when once you are passed over the grounds, you can never return to rectify your mistakes. The youth may have principles so firm that the most powerful temptations of Saturn will not draw them away from their legends. Okay, look at this. <clears throat> um, this will be interesting. We've talked about thou shalt not commit adultery. And <clears throat> we are told, <clears throat> trifling with hearts. Let me talk to men, because men, of course, women also trifle with hearts. And I'll talk to men a little bit. <clears throat> to trifle with arts is a crime of no small magnitude in the sight of a holy world. Oh, holy God. Trifling with hearts. And yet, some will show preference for young ladies and call their affection, and then go their way and forget all the words they have spoken and their effect. All right? I can't live without you. Do they remember them when they're walking out? You know all those nasty words that you speak. I don't know. Praise the Lord that I don't have them anymore in my head. You know all the flashy tests that you are. I can live without you. You are all heaven to me. I can go to heaven without you. I can do all these things. Everything, everything is selfishness. All right? Selfishness. And these things all slide out. And wow. They don't repeat them anymore. Okay? <laughs> I was once sitting in a council. And... Um, the sister asked, where are all the promises you made to? Now you are walking out. Where are all the privileges that I gave to you? Now you have abused me. Now you've left me. I'm not a woman. I have no self-esteem. I feel ashamed. And you want to walk scot-free? Maybe the only thing that can bind you with shame is if I was pregnant. Nothing more. You understand? Nothing more ashames you. The time you spent, the words you uttered in my ear, you are not ashamed. You are not suspicious. Trifling with hearts is not a light thing. Seeing one lady and leaving that lady and seeing another lady, that's not a light thing before God. And God doesn't take it lightly. And it's something that young youths, we need to confess like never before. A new face attracts them. And they repeat the same words, devote to another the same attention. Be careful when a man leaves you, or when a man leaves another woman for you, because it's just going to happen like that with you. He's going to leave you, all right? Be careful when you are being married as a second wife, because he will see another wife. He will tell you all the wrong things with the other girlfriend. Yes, he will tell another person all the wrong things with you. You understand now? Okay. Because love is patient, love is kind, love is not jealous, right? Love does not brag, it is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, it's not provoked, it does not take into account the wrongs, uh, wrong that is suffered. And then he said, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in what? With the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. That's love. Love is a precious gift and it comes from Jesus. Love is a precious gift and it comes from Jesus. Pure and holy affection is not a feeling. It is a word, a principle. Those who are actuated by true love are neither unreasonable nor blind. There is but little real, genuine, devoted, pure love. This precious article is a very rare passion. This precious article is, a very, is very rare. Passion is termed love. 
All right? So ask yourself, is what I'm experiencing passion or love? And we look at this man was shouting at his wife. True love is iron and holy principle, altogether different in character from the love which is awakened by impulse and which suddenly dies when severely done what? Tested. When love is severely tested, what happens? When poverty comes, what happens? When you see another person who looks beautiful than the other person, it quickly dies, isn't it? Quickly dies. When disease comes, it dies. When problems come in the family, it dies. But that's not with pure love. Okay? Love is the plant of heavenly growth, and it must be fostered and nourished. Affectionate acts, truthful, loving words will make happy families and exert and levitating influence upon all who will come within the sphere of their influence. And that's beautiful. Love is not unreasonable, it's not blind. So let someone not say love is what? It's blind. It's not, it's pure holy. But passion of the natural art is another thing altogether. While pure love will take God into its plans, all of it, and will be in perfect harmony with the spirit of God, passion will be headstrong. Does passion listen to counsels? No, passion is headstrong, rash, unreasonable, defiant of all restraints, and will make the object of its choice an idol. All right? In all departments of one who possesses true love, grace of God will be shown. Okay, we've looked at quite a couple number of things. And another thing you realize is the man who is bound in the chains of infatuation is too often deaf to the voice of reason and conscience. If you are infatuated, and what's that? Which makes you headstrong, blind, and uncontrollable. That's infatuation, all right? It's not true love. And those who are infatuated, they are deaf to the voice of reason. Do they use common sense? Mm -mm. And conscience. Neither argument nor entreaty can lead him to see the folly of his cost. He can never. All right? Mm -hmm. I know of a, a brother, and he told his parents, Maisha uh, Yamutu, Unatakia ni. Maisha mtu natakia? He didn't take, it took about four years and he came back to the same people he told the same thing. Say, hey, I want you people to help me. I can't live with that lady anymore. By that time, the voice of reason and conscience, neither argument nor entreaty could lead him to see the folly of his cause, all right? True love is not strong, fair, impetuous passion, on the contrary, it is the calm and deep in its nature. It looks beyond mere externals and is attracted by qualities alone. Amen. It is wise and discriminating, and its devotion is real and abiding. That's beautiful. Okay. I'll look at something here. <laughs> I don't have time for this. But to a youthful student, you are now a student. You are now in your student's life. Let your mind dwell upon spiritual subject. Keep all sentimentalism apart from your life. You are now in a formative period of character. Nothing with you is to be considered trifle or unimportant, which will distract you from your highest, holiest interest. Your efficiency in the preparation to do the work of God as, uh, as assigned you. And then students, 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 while at school, students should not allow their minds to become confused by thoughts of courtship, amen? There, they are there to gain a fitness to work for God. And this thought is ever to be utmost. All right? Some of those who attend the college do not properly improve their time. Full of buoyancy of youth, they span the reason that is brought to bear upon them. Especially, they do rebel against the rules that will, um, that will not allow young gentlemen to pay their attention to young ladies. Full well is known the evil of such a course in this degenerate age. The infatuation on the part of youths, both young men and women, in the, in, in the blessing of their affections upon each other during school days shows a lack of good judgment. So that's just it. So you can read all the uh, admonitions for young college students and a college student it would be well, could there be connected with our college, learn for cultivation and workshops under the charge of men competent to instruct students in 
departments of physical labor. So that, that's, that's uh, uh, important. Uh, late keeping of hours, that's just wrong. I would not have time to talk about that for now. Chatting besides the devil, yes. Let me talk about this and close up, home course. Another thing that says you are prepared to be married is home course, all right? Home course. Let me talk about this even without, uh, let me just read about uh, Javan Yance and talk about it. And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own, all right? So you find people who are not faithful in their own course. They don't know how to do plates in their own house. They don't know how to help their parents, isn't it? They don't know how to do their own clothes. They don't know how to arrange their own houses. They don't know how to do all these things, and yet they want to be married. So how are you going to keep your own house if you cannot keep the house of your parents? If you cannot do normal clothes, all right? I have always asked ladies, how does it feel when in, in, in Africa, where I know that many people uh, do laundry using their hands. It's, it's not like in the Western countries. But <clears throat> the truth of the matter is, it is something else and always another woman. And I've been reading these things, sometimes you find them in the, in the newspaper, where uh, someone just doing laundry in your house has been taken over as the wife of the house. Have you heard of such cases? Or a maid in the house has been taken over by your husband. Do you know why these things are happening? I, I'll just explain to you before we close up. Listen carefully. Sometimes these things look very simple, but you don't know the effect they have upon your partners. For example, think about the fact that you live and go to work and another woman serves your husband, cooks for him, and presents food to him. Who do you think between you and the woman is caring about your husband? It's your maid. It's the one who is doing laundry for your husband. He washes, he does high on his clothes, he puts them on the wardrobe. It's the one who is behind the good dressing of your husband, isn't it? He's the wife. You are only holding a certificate. All right, you understand? He's the one who prepares food for your husband welcomes him to the table and prays for your husband to eat before he goes to the work, to job. You already left for your work, all right? He takes care of your husband's children. Hello? He brings them up, he feeds them. Ideally, these things that are happening seems to the husband like this should be the wife, all right? And so in a short few months, few years, the husband turns their fiction from the woman he married and took vows to, to this lady. What has just happened? Because we neglected duties and what has caused us to neglect these duties? There are people who have got into marriage, but they are too much obedient to their bosses than to their family, isn't it? Uh, hello, young youths who have got jobs. You are too much obedient to your work than to your family, isn't it? You spare time for your job because of money, all right? Which cannot save your family. You don't have time for your husband, okay? You wake up and you're, I, I mean, I need to catch up with the bus and go to town and, and, and I need to arrive to, at, at work. All right, that's fine. He's not eaten. He does have place all this thing. The maid arrives a few hours later. He's still, he's still sleeping, he's laying about there. I'm talking to all of you people, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian. The maid begins to serve, to cook the food, get the children out of bed, do all these things. And then soon this man begins to find that the maid is more resourceful in this house than my own wife. And then what happens? The man looks another direction. What about men? Because they cannot bear the responsibilities. They don't have time for their families. Okay? The job takes their time. I live with a family that they left at midnight, not at midnight. They left at 4 a.m. They came back at 3 p.m. The children would call mom, auntie, and call the maid mom. Because they've never seen, all right? They've never seen them, the two, all right? The two are always a job. And you're like, okay, why did you get married in the first place if you are this busy? All right? 
They don't have a time with their children. The children don't know who they are. The characters of the children are like them. And you remember this story, which was in, in social media, where a lady got pregnant during the COVID crisis. And the lady told the parents that you cannot now be concerned about me when you have never been concerned about me. While I was a youth, you didn't take care of me. You didn't pray for me. You didn't do all these things to me, you remember? So how is it that right now, I, I am this old, I have messed up my life, and you're all of a sudden saying, now I think, I do what? I am concerned about you as my daughter, as my daughter. In your youth, uh, in your youth, or rather in their youth, while they were still young, did you spend time with your children? You were at the club, you are in the, the bar, isn't it? You are busy with your job projects, isn't it? You came home late. You left them a TV to teach them, isn't it? And so their parents were in the TV, isn't it? They were speaking to them, speaking to cartoons, and then they began speaking to soap operas. And you understand? Those are the people who they, they educated them. And the children are like, okay, you are blaming us today as parents. You're blaming us, right? But you put for us soap operas to watch. And soap operas taught us that unmarried people can kiss themselves, isn't it? So opera has told us that a man can marry a man, isn't it? So opera has taught us that a woman can marry a woman. So what? So opera has taught us you can send us to school and we can get pregnant and we can get abortion. That's what I taught us. So opera has taught us that dead people can talk. Our dead mothers can come and protect us and all these things. It's crazy because a woman cannot bear responsibility in a home. And so if you have this woman who cannot bear responsibility, she cannot cook food rightly, all right? All right? You understand? Yeah, you, you know, your wife should cook food right. Because if, if, if I leave this meeting, I don't want to eat anyway. I want to get to my house because if I eat there, they're going to tell me, you, you know, you need, need, need to eat in between what? In between meals. Because I know that my wife is going to prepare for me something good. What about if the food is not good at home? Hello? What's going to happen? The husband must seek for a place where the food is good, isn't it? So even bearing the house course can save our marriages. It, is it true? Yeah, doing things rightly, it can save our marriages from a huge mess. So if you are faithful in that which is another man's, then you can be trusted with your own, isn't it? And that's what God is teaching us, ideally. So I want to stop at that point for now and ask for blessings upon you people as we'll be looking at other steps. Step number one, is God calling you to marriage? Is it time? <clears throat> Step number two, are you prepared for marriage? Emotionally, are you prepared for marriage? Economically, are you prepared for marriage? By age, are you prepared for marriage? Are you mature to enter into marriage? That's when you step into these issues of courtship. We've not got to courtship. These people are not quoting it yet. They're still just asking questions. Is God calling? Well, if God has called me, then his biddings are his enablings. So he's going to provide. So the question is, am I prepared? Now, the God is calling me, am I prepared? Do I have a farm? Do I have a house? How will I feed my family? And so on and so on and so on, isn't it? You need to ask yourself this question. And then after that, you need to continue asking yourself a few more questions that you'll be asking yourself tomorrow and on Sunday before you enter into courtship. Now, if you jump into stage number four, you are in trouble. Okay? Because those stages are vitally important. May the Lord bless in Jesus Christ's name. So I'll pray, and then we'll give you opportunity to ask for questions if that be the case. So let's pray. Holy Father in heaven, we are so thankful for allowing us to speak, giving us stable internet and bringing your people to hear. We are praying that your spirit continue to guide and lead us into all truth. This is our prayer by faith in Jesus Christ's name. Mm -hmm. Amen. <clears throat> okay, thank you for that. Uh, okay. I don't know if there is any question. I'll be glad. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.